Good morning, everyone. Uh, trust you're keeping well this morning. Um, and uh, again, just to let you know that if you, if you need any help or if you're aware of any situation uh, in the congregation that you think uh, we should know about, then please do let us know. Please do get in contact with us. Um, midweek is going to happen at half past seven uh, this uh, Wednesday night, uh, and we'll send out the Zoom link later on today for that. Um, we're going to read from Mark chapter 3 uh, and verses 7 to 12. And it's a, a kind of a, a summary passage in some ways. So you might not think there's much going on here, but whenever we actually look at it, um, you'll see that there is uh, there's something that we need to learn from this passage. So Mark chapter 3 and verses 7 to 12. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and the Jumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him and he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. There's a lot in that passage uh, about crowds. Do you remember crowds? Crowds were things that you used to be uh, a part of whether you liked it or not at times. Um, you could be in a crowd that felt very comfortable and felt like somewhere you wanted to be, felt like it was enjoyable, like it was fun, like it was uh, a good time and you were all there for a common purpose to enjoy uh, a concert, or a sporting event, a rugby match, a football match, or whatever it might be. And, and you all had that common purpose, common enjoyment, and it was good to be part of a crowd. That's one type of crowd. There is, of course, the uncomfortable type of crowd. Uh, the crowd where you feel just a little bit uncertain, where you feel it might be just getting a bit dangerous, uh, or where you feel that, that you're part of a crowd which is angrily demanding something uh, and, and maybe protesting against something. Maybe this crowd even has the potential to turn into a mob. And we saw a crowd like that um, a few weeks ago in Washington DC, uh, that kind of uncomfortable crowd that started to demand and demand and demand and eventually became, uh, or at least some of them became violent. Very often, it seems, Jesus experiences, I would suggest, the second kind of crowd, the uncomfortable kind of crowd. And that's certainly what's suggested here uh, in Mark's Gospel. Uh, in verse 10, uh, we're, we're told um, that, he, he had, that they were pressing around to touch him, that he had to get a boat ready um, lest they crush him. Um, this seems to be that kind of crowd that could turn ugly at a moment's notice. Uh, this crowd falls on Jesus. It descends on him, it demands from him. Now it's not all bad, this crowd, because the crowd comes from all sorts of different places. We're told Jerusalem and Galilee and Judea, mostly uh, Jewish population, uh, from places like uh, Idumea and around the Jordan, a sort of mixed Jewish Gentile population, and from Tyre and Sidon entirely Gentile, so it kind of demonstrates Jesus' appeal across the kind of cultural, national, religious boundaries of the day. But at the same time, it demonstrates a crowd which is demanding from Jesus and which is clearly a concern uh, because he asked the disciples to get this boat ready. They looked like they could crush him with their demands at any moment. The crowd falls on him, it descends on him, and it demands from him. The other group that are mentioned in this passage are the demons who fall before him, be fall before him in terror because they know who he is. They know that he is the son of God. They understand what that means for them. If the kingdom of God is coming and the son of God has appeared, 
they understand what that means and they are terrified. And he silences them. Tells them to be quiet. I wonder how we respond at times to Jesus. We know who he is. We have the benefit of the Gospels. Uh, we are, we, it has been revealed to us in Scripture. We understand who Jesus is. He is the incarnate Son of God. He is uh, reigning at the Father's right hand right now. That is who he is. And we know that. How do we respond to him? Not only do we know who he is, but we know that he loves us. The demons responded by falling down in terror because they knew he was their enemy and their most feared enemy. But we know he loves us. He is the son of God. He is the king of kings. He reigns forever and he loves you and he loves me. How do we respond? Do we fall down and worship as we should? Or do we just demand stuff from him? There are three possible responses, really, to Jesus. You can have the response of the demons, who know who he is and reject him. Want nothing to do with him because he's the son of God. You can be with, like, the crowd, who don't know who he is, but just want stuff from him. Just demand stuff from him all the time. Don't really care who he is, to be honest, as long as he does what they want him to do, as long as he heals their diseases, as long as he gives them the stuff that they want. Or you can be like the disciples who are just sort of in the background in this passage, but who are with him. Jesus withdrew with his disciples. These are the people who spend time with him who grew in knowledge of him, who learn what it means to follow him. This is the response that he's looking for from us, to grow in him, to spend time with him, to follow him as he's called us to. Will we do that in this week and in the days to come? God bless.